First Kings chapter five is where we're going to be picking up and studying together uh, for this particular segment. And uh, we're excited to be able to jump into that. We're also excited that uh, this will be one of our uh, next to the last classes that we'll be doing in this format. Lord willing, in a couple of weeks, we'll be back in the uh, auditorium class together and studying together on Wednesday nights. Uh, we'll still be recording. It'll just be in a different setting. Obviously, we won't be in my office and there will be other people involved in class and we'll be able to have that interaction uh, once again. And so we're looking forward to that. That'll be April the 7th. Uh, April the 7th, we'll be back together for Bible classes on Wednesday evening. Uh, but for tonight and for our study, as we said, we're in 1 Kings chapter 5. Now, in chapter 5, all the way through chapter 8, what we see are Solomon's preparations and the building of and the dedication of the temple for God. In the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy chapter 12, which, of course, Deuteronomy was Moses' final sermons to the new generation that was coming into the promised land, he directed them in chapter 12 that God would choose a place to put his name. And eventually, of course, Jerusalem became that place. But it would be in that location that there he would be worshipped. And so what we see in chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8 of 1 Kings is that coming to fruition. The temple is coming to be built in the city of Jerusalem, and this will be the place where God's name dwells, where his presence dwells. Whereas we've already seen previously when we got to chapter 3 that the tabernacle was located in a different place. David had brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem in 2 Samuel 6, but the tabernacle was in another place, which was its secondary location. Its first location at Shiloh had been destroyed, according to Jeremiah chapter 7. And so it found its second home that uh, we found Solomon worshiping there in 1 Kings chapter 3. But now it will have a permanent residence, whereas the tabernacle was just a tent, a temporary structure. This will be a permanent physical structure uh, that cannot be packed up and moved. And it will become one of the central focus points uh, throughout the books of Kings and really throughout the rest of the Israelite nation. It will be destroyed and rebuilt, of course, and then there will be a third addition uh, built to it uh, by Herod the Great and would still be under renovation at the time of Jesus in the New Testament. And so this begins a long and rich heritage uh, in the Jewish nation. And so the, what we see in this chapter is the preparation process is beginning with a treaty that's made between Hiram, the king of Tyre, and the new king Solomon. And so as we think about this chapter, we're simply told in the first 12 verses, and it's not a very long chapter, but in the first 12 verses, we're told about the treaty that's made between Solomon and Hiram. And then in the last section, the last few verses, verses 13 through 18, we see Solomon's division of labor uh, in order to amass all the materials that are needed in order to build the temple. And so, as we think about this, let's begin in chapter 5, verse 1. It says, Now Hiram king of Tyre sent his servants to Solomon when he heard that, that uh, they had anointed him king in the place of his father, for Hiram always loved David. Now Hiram <clears throat> was a ruler of Tyre in this area known as Phoenicia. Tyre and Sidon were sister cities. And they would rotate back and forth many times in their prominence. But they were major commercial cities on the Mediterranean Sea. They didn't have a lot of land. Their wealth did not come from agriculture uh, the way that it would with the children of Israel. And we'll see that come to play a little bit later in this treaty that's uh, struck between Solomon and Hiram. But they were made wealthy by their commerce, by their sea trade. And so being port cities, they would trade all over the Mediterranean, some even suggesting that they had uh, the, the reaches of that commerce even went into Spain, which was quite far away uh, from this part of the Mediterranean seacoast, the eastern side. And so Hiram dwells there. He has, he's going to rule for about 30 years, 30 plus years. He's going to build three elaborate temples himself. He's obviously going to be involved in helping uh, Solomon build uh, the temple of the Lord, at least providing some of the services uh, in that process. And so he's going to be allied with Solomon as he was allied with David. Now, you remember in 2 Samuel 5 and verse 11 that Hiram sent and produced or, or provided some of the cedars by which David would build his own house, his own royal palace. And so there was always a special connection, as the text says, for Hiram always loved David. And part of that may have had to do with Tyre and Sidon being commercial cities in the northern portion uh, of Palestine. And the bitter rivals of Israel were the Philistines, and they were also a coastal 
nation on the southern portion of the Mediterranean Sea, uh, or I should say further south, many miles separated Philistia from Phoenicia when you look at the map. But in 2 Samuel 8, when we learn about the conquest of David, David gained control over the Philistines. And so when he did that, it eliminated the only really threatening force in commerce to Tyre and Sidon. So he would have good reasons to befriend David. Uh, obviously, there were plenty of other reasons, but that would be a very good one in that he put down their one enemy and they shared a common enemy. And so uh, they were united together in that way as well. And so this he's sending uh, a messenger, uh, an envoy to Solomon, obviously to try and come to agreeable terms with Solomon. He wants to continue the relationship with Solomon that he had with his father. And so he sends this envoy to a new king, which was not uncommon uh, for dignitaries to come and visit the new king. And it's still a practice uh, throughout the world today in the civilized portions of it anyway. And then in verse two, we have Solomon's response to Hiram. It says, and Solomon sent word to Hiram, you know that David, my father, could not build a house for the name of the Lord his God because of the warfare with which his enemies surrounded him until the Lord had put them under the soles of his feet. And so he begins by explaining to Hiram what it is he wants to do. He wants to build this temple. Now, he's getting there by saying David wanted to do that, but because he was a man of bloodshed, and that's one of the reasons God did not allow David to build the temple. You remember in 2 Samuel 7, he wants to build the temple. He looks in this house, his palace that Hiram had helped him build, 2 Samuel 5, 11, and now in 2 Samuel 1, 7, in verse 1, he looks around and says, I'm dwelling in a house made of cedars, and the ark of the Lord is dwelling in tents. Why do I live in a permanent structure while the ark lives in, in basically a, a big tent? And so he wanted to build a temple to the Lord. And, of course, Nathan first told him that he could, and then God spoke to Nathan. Nathan comes back to David and says, no, you cannot build it, but I'm going to build you a house, that lineage, that important statement in 2 Samuel 7. However, <clears throat> one of the reasons why he was not allowed to build the temple was because he was a man of war and bloodshed. And that's what he goes on to say here, First Chronicles 28 and verse 3, we see a more detailed approach to that. And God had put all the enemies under the feet of David, under the feet, the suppression of enemies. And throughout scripture, the placing underneath the feet is the idea of putting enemies in subjection. And we see it, uh, for an example, in Joshua chapter 10, when Joshua has, when they're conquering that confederation of kings, and Joshua has the people come and put their foot on the throat of those kings. It's the idea of submission, and it's found all throughout the New Testament. Uh, when describing death, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. He must reign till God has put all things under his feet, 1 Corinthians 15. And so that's what's going on. This imagery is one that's quite important throughout the rest of Scripture. He says, verse 4, but now uh, the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor misfortune. And so I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord said to David my father, your son, whom I will set on your throne in your place, shall build a house for my name. And so he's explaining once again to Hiram what's going on. David, my father, wanted to do it. There was war and bloodshed in his time, but now there's peace. God made a promise to him that one of his descendants would build the temple, and now I'm on the throne, and I intend to carry out um, the wishes I intend to carry out the wishes of my father and that which God had prophesied and spoken of beforehand. And so he's seeking his assistance in this process. Now, again, this is all second Samuel seven, which we've talked about it some in our sermons and classes and other places. But second Samuel seven is one of the key texts in the old Testament uh, messianically when it comes to talking about Jesus, but also when it comes to understanding what's going on, uh, with David and his family and, and understanding what happens in the kingdom itself as it grows. Uh, 2 Samuel 7 just is an important text to know and to be familiar with. So I would encourage you to read it if you don't remember the contents of it. Now in verse 6, he says, Now therefore, command that the cedars of Lebanon be cut for me, and my servants will join your servants, and I will pay your servants such wages as you set. For you know that there is no one among us who knows how to cut timber like the Sidonians. Now, when we look at what is going on here, he's asking for materials, the cedars of Lebanon, these majestic cedars that would grow to be at least 100 feet tall. 
And if you put that in comparison to say some of the oaks in that particular area would have grown to only be 50 feet. Now that's certainly a large tree, 50 feet, but a hundred feet consistently. And these cedars were durable. They were resistant to worms and to rotting. They could be polished to a fine shine. Uh, they did very well with water. They were often used in shipbuilding because of that, their ability to work and not to get destroyed by water, but also because of their length in order to build large ships. Then um, <clears throat> they're also pictured as these great symbols of strength and eloquence. Uh, for an example, in uh, Psalm 92 or Ezekiel 31, they're pictured as these great, strong, majestic, <clears throat> excuse me, trees. But also remember that the end of chapter four, when discussing Solomon's wisdom, it said he knew he had wisdom and knowledge in the areas. He spoke of trees from the cedar that is in Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the wall. The cedar in Lebanon, as we said, the largest of the tree to the hyssop, the little, the little sprout that grows out of the wall, kind of like a, a wild vine, we might think of it uh, in that particular context. Of course, a hyssop was much more than that, but in the context of growing out of the wall, much similar, much like a wild vine for us. And so <clears throat> we see that he's drawing these magnificent cedars in in order to build the temple for the Lord. And so that's what he's seeking in this agreement. Then in verse 7, it says, And as soon as Hiram heard the words of Solomon, he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be the Lord this day, who has given to David a wise son to be over his great people. And so he realizes that this uh, treaty, this uh, partnership is going to continue as it had with his father David is now going to continue with the son Solomon and he's certainly excited about that and David and, and David has a wise son on his throne which did not always happen um, it's not going to happen when it comes to Solomon and his son Rehoboam but he's got his wise son on the throne and Solomon is there and so Hiram knows he has someone he can work with and so Hiram sent to Solomon saying I have heard the message that you have sent to me I'm ready to do all you desire in the matter of cedar and cypress timber. So I've gotten the, I've gotten your letter and I'm going to provide that for you. He says this, but my servants will bring it down to the sea from Lebanon and will make it into rafts to go by the sea to the place you direct. And I will have them broken up there and you will receive it. And you shall meet my wishes by providing food for my household. And so he says, my people will cut down the trees, the Sidonians, as even Solomon has said, were expert, uh, experts in this area of cutting trees and preparing wood uh, and preparing the process so that they could move it or, or make it into um, a usable product. And so he said, we're going to do that. We're going to cut it down and then we're going to make them into rafts. Now, when you look at Second Chronicles chapter 2 and verse 16, we learned that they would cut them down, they would make them into crafts, and they would float them down the Mediterranean Sea to the port city of Joppa, okay? Of course, Joppa, the place where Jonah tried to flee in the book of Jonah. That, that is, he went down to Joppa and there tried to flee to Tarshish, which is in Spain. And so Hiram is going to get these trees cut, and again, they're big and they're heavy, and so transporting them over land would be a little bit more difficult. So to make it easier, we're going to bind them together, make them rafts, float them down to Joppa, and at Joppa we'll dismantle the rafts, okay, that which has tied them together and held them together, and then we will <clears throat> take those logs and we will transport them to Jerusalem in order for that to be happened, in order uh, for you to use them in the building of the temple. So he says, I'm going to do that for you. You provide food for me and for my household. Now, Phoenicia, as we said, was a small region. It, it did not have a lot of farmland the way that Israel did. And so in their commercial trade, what made them wealthy was their commerce. And in their commercial trade, many of the goods that they would trade would have to be food for their citizens because they could not grow it uh, in their particular nation that is not in abundance in any real way uh, to be a national to, or to be a global player in that market or even really to take care of their own citizens. So <clears throat> they negotiate this price. So he says, verse 11, while Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 cores of wheat as food for his household and 20,000 cores of beaten oil, Solomon gave this to Hiram year by year. That is in this whole process of building the temple and it was a several year process as we'll see as this unfolds. And so every year annually, he's making this payment to Hiram. Now to put this in perspective, 20,000 cores of wheat 
would be like 50,000 bushels or 800 tons of wheat a year. And so it's a large amount of wheat. And then you have the 20,000 cores of beaten oil, which would have been 100,000 plus gallons of oil. And so he's providing all of this to Hiram in return for, and so they're trading goods, they're trading services with one another, not necessarily so much that actual money is changing hand in currency the way that we often do it, but rather trading services in the process. Verse 12, and it says, and the Lord gave Solomon wisdom as he promised him, and there was peace between Hiram and Solomon, and the two of them made a treaty. And so again, we see this reference to <clears throat> the wisdom of Solomon for which he has asked in chapter three. And we've seen that wisdom in so many different areas. We saw it in the judiciary at the end of chapter three where the two harlots come over in a dispute over whose baby, to whom the baby, the living baby belongs. And so we saw his judicial wisdom that took place in chapter three. And then we see his organizational, his administrative wisdom in chapter four as he, uh, assigns different individuals to different parts of the nation and to oversee and to make sure that the administration goes well. And then we see his wisdom just in general in all different types of things in the second part of chapter four and just pure knowledge and breadth of mind uh, that exists within him. And now we see it here, he's, a, he's good at international diplomacy. He's able to make treaties. And so his wisdom is just constantly being displayed and increasing in this process. Now, his administration abilities are seen once again as he has to he has to have a large workforce in order to be able to do this. You don't have heavy equipment or machinery like we do today. And so you have to have a lot of manpower in order to accomplish these things. And the building of the temple is, is, is quite a wonder. And we'll see that when we get there's a statement in chapter six that's quite amazing about the precision with which they built the temple. But we'll save that for then. But let's look at his organization of the workers in verse 13. It says King Solomon drafted forced labor out of all Israel, and the dra and he and the draft number, uh, and the draft numbered, excuse me, thirty thousand men, and so he drafts Israelites. Now you have to remember this is not a republic, a, 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 a democracy, a representative democracy, a representative republic, whatever you want to call it. This is a monarchy, and so the king can call you into his service anytime he gets ready, and so he's calling thirty thousand people to work for him. Now he does have wisdom in how he does this. In verse 14, it says, and he sent them to Lebanon, 10,000 a month in shifts. And so he drafts these 30,000 men into service, but he sends them in shifts of 10,000 apiece. So in essence, what you get is you have a group of 10,000 will go and work for a month, be home two months. And then, so each group will enjoy that process. And so they're only working a few months out of the year and so they're not being a real threat uh, to their livelihood and to their family. But at the same time, it's also keeping morale up. They don't have to stay away from their family for a long time. It's just a month's period uh, of service. And they get to come home and spend time with their family and take care of their affairs as well. And so you see his wisdom as he's sending them out to Lebanon to work. Then Adoniram was in charge of this draft, one a person in his administration, which we saw the administration uh, discussed in the first part of First Kings chapter 4. Then it says, <clears throat> Solomon also had 70,000 burden bearers and 80,000 stone cutters in the hill country. So you have 70,000 burden bearers. These are This is most likely what we might consider to be slave labor in the sense of these are captive peoples. Uh, in the conquerings of David, he took people captive and, and compelled them to serve uh, Israel. Uh, is as a result of their fighting against Israel. And so he uses them for burden bearers to transport. It would take obviously hundreds and hundreds and literally here thousands upon thousands of men in order to transport all of these goods to get these large stones and, and, and the timber and put them on uh, carts and to be able to move them. He's going to need a lot of manpower to do that. And then you've got 80,000 stone cutters in the hill country because large and, and the building of these temple, the, this temple, some of these temple stones are going to be absolutely gigantic. And the precision with which they're going to cut these stones is quite phenomenal. But in this process, he needs 80,000 men out there working and at stone, cutting stones in the hill country. In verse 16, beside that, Solomon's 3,300 chief officers 
who were over the work. So you've got your other administrators, your different managers and, and organizers and section leaders. And they, were, they had charge of the people who carried out the work. Now, for a moment, I might just pause here and say that when you look at some of the other accounts in, say, 1 Kings 9 or, or later in the Chronicles, and you see the numbers are a little varied, part of that has to do with how you reckon the numbers. Um, and so it's, it's not a contradiction. It's rather in how you understand those numbers in that um, some of them are design, some of them are more specific. They show one is more all encompassing. These are all the people that worked. Some are more specific. These are the Israelite people who worked. These are the uh, slave people who worked. These are the Canaanite individuals who were in administration. Here were the Israelite people who were in administration. And so understanding that helps you to kind of work through some of the numbers and some of the uh, differences in the other texts. Then in verse 17, it says, at the king's command, they quarried out great costly stones in order to lay the foundation of the house with dressed stones. And so they're making out these the foundation stones. And of course, this is uh, obviously important. It's going to serve as the foundation of the whole structure. But also this imagery is picked up in the New Testament. Of course, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Uh, the cornerstone being the first stone that was placed, it determined the direction of the building, whether it was a square, whether it was perfectly positioned, uh, it could it determined the strength of the building, so many other things. And so here Solomon is having them do this and then doing this with dressed stones, very costly stones. And so, you know, a lot of times we don't uh, have special requests about our foundation. We don't really care how it looks, so to speak. We just want it to be sure. Okay. We don't, for an example, we're not concerned with uh, certain markings and making sure that our foundation floors are painted and they, they put forth a, a good image because most of the time you're not going to see them. Their foundations are going to be covered up. But that shows you Solomon's dedication to excellence and to what is going on in the building of the temple, that there will be no corners that are cut that only the very best will go into building the temple of the Lord. That these stones that are, are, that are uh, serving as the foundation, many of which will not be seen, still must be the very best quality. And they must be, and no expense must be spared. And so the idea is that he's putting forth the very best in building this temple for the Lord. It says in verse 18, so Solomon's builders and Hiram's builders and the men of Gibal did the cutting and prepared the temple and prepared the timber and the stone to build the house. Now the men of Gabal, uh, when you look at, uh, they're from the region, obviously they're from Israel, Joshua chapter 13 and verse five, they also worked with the people of Tyre. You look at, uh, for example, Ezekiel 27 and verse nine, that was their craftsmanship and their skills are part of what enriched the people of Phoenicia. And so <clears throat> they're involved in helping this process as well. And so what we're seeing are the upfront preparation process where you have the treaty that struck between Hiram and Solomon, and then you see the division of forces and how they're going about gathering up all the materials and the massive labor force that was involved in order to get this construction of the temple underway. And as we progress through this, and as we move into chapter six, we'll see just how good they were in the process of building this temple and uh, all of the work that went into this process. And so we hope that you'll be with us as we continue this study together and hope that we'll remember that as we're looking at this, we're obviously seeing in all of Solomon's greatness, we're seeing someone far greater than Solomon in Jesus. Even Jesus himself would say that in Matthew 12 and in Luke chapter 11, that even as great as the temple is that Solomon built for the Lord, it pales in comparison to the temple that Jesus has built the church uh, in order for a habitation of God through the spirit, Ephesians 2, 18 through 22. So always wanna keep that in mind. We always wanna be looking and understanding the text in front of us, but also looking ahead and seeing what it foreshadows and how Jesus and his way and his kingdom and his building is far superior to that of Solomon. So we hope you'll continue to be with us as we watch this story unfold.